All right, welcome everyone who is here and people will trickle in. I'm thrilled to uh, be hosting and holding space for this second winter Twilight Go Around table. We're focused on payback on purchasing a new wash uh, pack equipment and hopefully we'll take a good holistic look at some different type, types of equipment and the different ways people look at this and ideally you leave here today with um, you know some new ideas something to employ so i think most people know this who are here but uh, just real quickly the scrub project we're um uh we are a three-year project and I'll, I'll say a tiny bit more about it but it's the uvm extension team is fern and myself and chris callahan and andy chamberlain who's here billy mitchell's down in georgia um, and we got some folks from Cornell, Robert and Lori, and Phil, who's here from Michigan State as well, is calling in today. Uh, yeah, this is a really simple, uh, low-key uh, sharing discussion is the main thing. A uh, quick intro logistics, and then we're mostly sharing some slides and thoughts and about new equipment and was it worth it or what are we thinking about that kind of thing uh and then uh, last 10 minutes just want to make sure you guys fill out a little um a form which just takes a minute to do uh, just because we need that for our reporting and also if we ever want to follow up um or if you want to follow up with us okay so just in terms you know come because of the number of people here just pipe up anytime uh, or you can raise your hand if you want and write in the chat is great if you've got comments. Uh, so we'll just be sort of an interactive group. Uh, again, three year project here and all that we're doing with Scrub is we're developing a lot of different kinds of resources based on what all the growers we're meeting with identify and we've done some surveys as well and we're doing some workshops and other kinds of events like this one holding space for four things. And we're shooting to support, you know, several several hundred growers over three years, both meeting one on one and helping to implement projects, think about things, and reduce uh, food safety risks while we're doing that. Um, all right. So I'm going to um, pause for one second because it's someone's asking me, hey. Um, Andy, sorry to, I know we're recording this, but uh, would you, could you send Kyle from Thousand Stones Farm? He's trying to get in, but doesn't have the link. Um, would you be able to send him that? Yeah. Yep, sure. Okay. So I'm going to show two slides here. And uh, what, let's start. The intro is really just let's go around, introduce yourself, your farm, where you're coming from. And any piece of equipment, and even if you're an educator, something you've run into, um, any piece of equipment that you have in your wash pack or have thought about having or have focused on if you're an educator going around, you know, from all the different kinds of, and by the way, Andy did this graph, these graphics are really great, um, but spinners of various sizes, manual um, barrel washers, Rinse conveyors, these are all the brush brush washers, sorting tables, drum washers, hand wash sinks, different kinds of produce sinks, stock tanks, um, rubber made stock tanks, duck tanks, greens bubblers, triple base sinks, um, and it goes on crates of various sizes and forms. Oh, how do you cool stuff uh, from cool bots to split refrigerations, different kinds of spray equipment, nozzles and tables, spray tables into how to convey and lifting and bin dumpers, et cetera. So um, yeah, think of a piece of equipment you have, big or small, that has sat with you, you thought about or labored over if you wanted to purchase it or not. Um, you got it, you're looking back, was it maybe worth it or not? You don't have to say much about that right now. We'll get back into that. Or maybe you're thinking about something, <laughs> but something you might want to focus on or spend a little time talking about uh, today if if possible okay so i'm going to just step out of, of this slideshow for a second and we'll go around and introduce ourselves all right how many who do we got here at this point okay well hopefully we'll get some more people coming in let's let's start start out and um well i can start all right you go ryan 
Uh, my name is Ryan Demarest. I have a naked acre farm in Hyde Park. It's a, about a three acre, um, soon to be maybe two acre farm. Um, to just diversified veggies uh, with a few greenhouses. Um, and I guess the thing that I, I mean, there's, there's so many things and upgrades. Like I would say upgrading is just kind of where we're at right now, uh, starting pretty bare bones on raw land five years ago. Um, so I guess the thing I've been thinking about was a, a barrel washer for a long time, and I just got a used one like a couple weeks ago. Um, so I'm pretty psyched about that um, and trying to implement that. But now I got to build more onto the barn to like have a space for it. So, <laughs> but that's exciting. What kind of barrel washer you get? It's Ryan. just one of the um, the grindstones or whatever they're called, the, the wooden okay. ones there. Um, I got it for pretty cheap, so actually it was Geo's old one, Geo Huntingford down in Hurricane Flats. So nice, this is old one. Nice. Yeah, so happy cool. to pass it. Happy to continue that that tradition. Great, and and um, you know maybe thinking if you're in expansion mode, we'll get back to some of the things you're thinking about, and other folks on the call could weigh in. Um, that'd be that'd be great. Cool. Yeah. All right. Who, who else? Patrick, are you where are you calling in from? Yeah, uh, Patrick Hearn here from Acton, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. uh, Natural Partners Farm. Uh, uh -huh. It's it's uh, five acres. I'll probably be farming about three acres. It's a, a restoration project. It was farmed about 60 years ago. Went back to timber. <clears throat> and uh, so I've got a lot of work to do. And I don't really have any washing equipment yet, but I am starting to grow. So I was here to see what uh, is going to be the best investment for my dollar in in wash pack. Great. Did you just hop hop in, or did um, I don't know if you or when you came in if you saw the beginning of that intro just with all that? All I did. The stuff. I did see that. Yeah, I came in okay. at about four four oh two. So yeah, I saw it. Okay, that's great. And I wrote it all down. <laughs> so there. <laughs> All right, uh, Carrie, you, you want to jump in? Hi there. Um, hey. I joined a little late because I didn't realize I needed Microsoft Teams. So um, I'm in my going into my third year of production, and um, I have very primitive wash, and I'm just upgrading as I can. Um, so I just like to collect ideas along the way. I do not have a building. I do it outside. So mm. I just am improve as I have the means and time and space. So I'm always just great. collecting ideas for, for the future. Cool. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Kyle. Um, how are you guys? Hey, how's it going? Good. Yeah. Hello. So we are um yeah, we're just going around, introduce yourself, um, and where you're coming from, how much you're farming, and then uh, you know, pick a piece of equipment or two that you have either recently purchased or thinking about purchasing that you know you might love to, to uh, talk about today a little get into okay could be um, could be uh, cooler yeah. stuff to wash pack whatever um anything it's yeah. it's pretty pretty open yep um i'm kyle Dota. this is betsy simpson um when we own a thousand stone farm in brookfield vermont um we run uh, five or six acres ish um, and um, we are uh, pulling the trigger on a addition onto our barn that's going to have um, a much much bigger space for us to um, actually have storage and wash pack and um, we've been running out of well Hans and Andrew know but a pretty <laughs> small um, the whole building footprint is maybe 820, 825 square feet, which includes a walk-in. Um, in our wash pack uh, scenario, um, so yeah, it's it's definitely time for us to have a little more space to work. It's pretty crazy, um, but you know you get used to it. So um, yeah, I guess I don't necessarily. I mean, we just finished a walk-in that I built um, from scratch this year, this fall, and we're able to 
um, use it and are still using it, which is great. Um, so I could talk about that a little bit for sure. But um, yeah, just here to think about new wash pack equipment, what that looks like. Also like fruit washing equipment. Um, we've started a cidery and so um, we are processing apples and we'll be processing other fruits and mm -hmm. just things in that nature. So um, vegetables as well, but. Right. That's pretty exciting that you guys are, are uh, pulling the trigger on that. It is. I just submitted the loan on Friday, so uh, it's a little nerve wracking, but we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Life is short. Might as well. Money's, money's just make believe. Uh, it, it is what it is. It does seem to come and grow and. Go yeah. Ahead, so. Yeah. All right. Who do we got? Maybe um, pick, if if it's possible to put your video on if you're talking. Uh, Chandler, are you there? I don't. I'm just looking at the list of names. I'm hey here. All right. Yeah. Shoot. You know what you're doing? What we're doing for intro? Yeah, I heard. I just came in. Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. Um, it's all right. Uh, I own a six acres of produce uh, mixed power farm in uh, southeast Washington state. Um, oh. This is in our eighth season. Um, we have a uh, open air covered pack shed with um, a walk-in cooler. We're about to add another walk-in cooler. We currently use an AZS rinse conveyor uh, with high volume, high pressure. Um, and we also have a homemade barrel washer. Um, those are the two main pieces of equipment. We also use, you know, dunk tank, salad spinner, uh, pressure, uh, just a regular pressure washer. And we are getting free assistance in um, getting GAP certified um, through the Food Hub Network out here. So one of the things that I'm coming at it from is also, you know, how to do this, uh, you know, from a food safety perspective. And and she's our specialist who's helping us has been here. But um, and one question I have is that the the, the rinse conveyor sometimes feels a little uh, inefficient for our scale. And I think that we're just wondering if there are any tips or thoughts in order to use it uh, in, a, in a more uh, F with more efficacy. Um, uh, yeah, we have a pretty sticky silt clay soil. Um, so that's why we got the rinse conveyor with the pressure washer to try and do crates clean up mm -hmm. that way. Um, there's also a question about our barrel washer. Uh, we put in AstroTurf because it was uh, not washing them well enough with just the wood. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a a red flag for food safety concerns as well because it can't be sanitized very easily. Mm -hmm. um, so any any thoughts or feedback on that would be helpful. Um, yeah, and we're doing mixed mixed uh, vegetables, so uh, everything from you know um, cauliflower to potatoes, lots of root vegetables in the fall that we use to store and sell all winter. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great. Yeah. Well, um, we definitely might get into some tips and tricks for how to use some of this stuff we have should have a couple people who have some good experience with rinse conveyors showing up here and between andy and i we have seen quite a few of those um, in action uh, andy more than i so i'm sure we can have some discussion about that all right who else um uh it, Andy and Elizabeth, I see you here, and Phil, we could do quick introductions there. So Chris, uh, Andy, you want to start? Yeah, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Andy Chamberlain from UVM Extension uh, Ag Engineering. I am work with uh, Chris Callahan and Hans Estrin here on the produce safety team. Uh, my specialty is kind of wash pack, post-harvest type stuff, but generally fairly knowledgeable in veg farming. Um, Base because I've been with Extension for five years now. Uh, I've seen quite a few farms. So, uh, welcome and thanks for joining us today. You have a little, you have a farm yourself too. Yep. It, yep. 
pumpkins, sweet corn, and hay is what we're doing at the moment. So. <laughs> Great. Uh, Heather, you out there? Looks like. Yeah, this is Heather Bryan. I'm sorry, Hans. I I um I have issues, so I can't turn my camera on. But um, oh, that's right. Uh, I'm with UNH Cooperative Extension, and uh, one thing I didn't see on your slides with the thumbnails of equipment, I do see in some farms, is um, hoses that hang from the ceiling, and they're not cheap. But everybody I've ever talked to who's put them in their wash pack shed raves about them and i'm a little bit curious how people think about them in terms of payback because i'm working off the assumption that the main value that you do is in employee happiness and avoiding hazards and maybe some food safety issues but how do you attach numbers to that to know whether or not it's a worthwhile thing to buy for your firm is a question that's a very good question, and I'm not. Does anyone on this call have um, hanging hoses or hang hose hanging sets setups? Just curious. This is Chandler. I've heard uh, also great things from friends, and I actually have that in my cart right now. Uh, from <laughs> in my in uh, my cart, I'm about to buy one and, and try one myself. Excellent. Who is that um, you're hanging from? I found it on Johnny's uh, website. Oh. Yep. Feel free during this time too, if you have a, a photo and know how to share, you're welcome to do that if we get into it. Um, not necessarily right this second, but uh, it's an option. Uh, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Hodgson. I'm a regional vegetable specialist and food safety educator with Cornell Cooperative Extensions, uh, Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program team, and I'm based up in Plattsburgh, New York. Um, I guess I don't have a piece of equipment that I'm particularly intrigued by, but I'm really interested in uh, hearing the experiences of the, the growers who are on the call. And Phil, thank you, Elizabeth. Hi, Hi folks, I'm Phil Toko. I'm with Michigan State University Extension. I'm an extension educator uh, covering the entire state with respect to on-farm food safety. Um, I'm um, most curious about the idea of what triggers the upgrade from a hand crank uh, salad spinner or a bigger one of those one of those like two gallon motorized salad spinners to something like a um, a uh, uh, washing machine green spinner, or even buying a a commercial green spinner. Like what what what's the trigger? What makes you guys you know how how big do you have to be before you're like yeah I got to do this? You should just do, just definitely do it. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. And you'll be driving, I, I take it, but um, definitely feel free well, to pipe I, in. I just got home, so in about five minutes, I'll be logging in for work. Awesome. So. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, great. So, yeah, I'm, oh, I forgot to introduce myself. So, Hans Hestrin, and I think I'm actually I'm now sharing some photos, but in a similar way, this I see sort of a lot of the high pressure stuff is in in, you know, cranking out whatever a hundred few hundred pounds of mixed salad greens and how to do that in a way where where are those break points from different size orders? And uh, so whether it's, you know, sinks, tanks to conveyance or, you know, especially different kinds of drying things, the whole spinning drying is is like a conundrum. Um, and I do have some of this myself as well with a small a small farm, but it's like whatever, 20 pounds of greens or something like that. Um, so and I'm interested too in sorting tables and ergonomics and flow. Um, so those those kinds of things seem like the payback where the payback is not, uh, you know, it might be more complicated than just money stuff. Um, all right. Is that everyone? For now, and then if we get more, well, we should have a couple more people coming in. We better because I have some photos loaded 
uh, that <laughs> they're coming. So um, did I miss anyone? OK, um, I'm going to say one thing really quick to help frame this discussion, um, or at least be able to reference it, that uh, when we're thinking about payback or thinking about is it worth buying something, the obvious thing that people often go to is financial. And I think what I've seen is that if we think frame this as a sort of more holistic payback concept and this idea of profitability and cost versus production efficiency, that's like the standard. That's what a lot of people think about. OK, it costs this much. I'm paying this much. But what am I getting back in return and how efficient is it? Is it going to be profitable? And that's probably the most important thing, at least to get started. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're also really looking at that, the quality of the produce and food safety is also an issue, how cleanable, the durability of it. And there's, there is an overlap in those things. And, you know, ideally you're, you're in that overlap zone where it's, it's both good quality and it's profitable. Um, and then it's like, definitely worth it. But what's also added to this is that quality of life, like when you've got this flow um, and the crew knows there's different things they can do and the equipment works and people know how to use it and things just work. Um, and the crew tends to stay around because the things work and they have jobs. And and when you get that triple overlap, that is really, a, it can be really amazing. So that sort of thinking about multiple benefits. And I hope when we're talking today, we can we can actually expand into this more holistic um, point of view. So uh, that's the only premise of that I want to introduce this conversation with. And other than that, we're stepping back uh, a little bit. And that my new spinner, you know, it's just I go to sleep at night and I think about it and I have dreams and I wake up, you know, whatever. Um, and there's some enjoyment in that. Um, all right. With that said, uh, let's see. We don't have Phoenix here, correct? This is the line there. They've just invested in this, including hose hangers. And um, Phoenix was going to talk about some of their decisions coming into this. Um, and I did just email him. Uh, Andy, have you been up here? I mean, we have talked to them, yeah. I believe, online, right? Yeah, I visited um, Hallbrook Farm uh, up in Thorndike, Maine earlier this fall when they just barely finished this new whole new washback building. So mm -hmm. um, I interviewed him and we put together a blog post kind of highlighting this mm -hmm. project. Um, so um, maybe, yeah, maybe what we could do, Andy, if you're OK, if, if Phoenix doesn't show up, we could kind of come back to this and you say a little bit more. Is that would that be reasonable and people sure. could could have a little conversation about it? Mm -hmm. OK, where did I cut you off? Are you going to say something else or? Uh, not really. I was just okay. making it up as I go along. OK. <laughs> All right. Well, let's come back to this um, at some point. That's a video which I won't show. And is Pooh here yet? Pooh um, from Edgewater Farm. So they, yeah, I don't know where these people are. I just talked to them recently, so something's going on. Um, but we can come back to this uh, if he comes. This is a before picture, and they moved into a new facility after. So a lot of thinking about equipment, and and Pooh's been farming for at least four decades, and has a good good experience with some of this stuff. Um, OK. So hi, Phil, you're here. <laughs> so let's um, at, you know, at this point, I guess what I would like to do, given that the two two people who were going to actually say something more significant aren't here, um, is turn it over to, you know, the the folks that are really kind of in the thick of uh, making some of these decisions. Um, what are you pondering? What, you know, in terms of the financial stuff, but also payback um, about, you know, in in time, you know, is this is it worth making this step to do to get one piece of equipment or another? So I know, you know, Ryan, you're doing an expansion and of course, um uh kyle and betsy you guys are 
facing a bunch of a bunch of stuff right now and it sounds like others yeah. as well i could so I, yeah go ahead i guess the simple question to the group we like somebody brought up um greens washing i think ryan you might have mentioned your opinion on it but i'd like to hear more we probably process um between 60 and 150 pounds a week annually um with a hand crank standard two and a half gallon spinner and some uh pretty relatively small wash sinks um we we have a five gallon might even be bigger i think it's a five gallon electric that we haven't set up yet just because honestly there's not space wise and just i think that it might be bigger than that but either way um as we move into a bigger space ideally that would be set up and then just trying to think about um what other components besides, you know, like, I guess we could talk sinks and stuff like that, but are there things that um, you all have found and in, in kind of discussing that size of volume of weight of greens that you're processing? Um, and most of our, well, we do bulk and package, so I guess it kind of is across the board, but um, yeah, I'm just curious to hear other people's opinions on the electric spinners and what's worked and et cetera. When you say five gallon electric spinner, you're, that sounds like a restaurant spinner size with like an electric plug in kind of thing, I, or is yeah. I think it's actually more like I want to say it's more like a 10 or 15. It's a large. I mean, it's just it's on its own wheel set. It's on the ground. It's probably someone had given it to us. Um, hmm. I forget the brand, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, sorry, green machine um, or something. Yeah, I could probably look it up. Um, I guess well, if, some of the questions. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I was just I was uh, putting that out to the group, but go ahead and you finish because that might prompt people. Yeah, like as have people found any like it's too rough on certain greens like spinach or you know lettuce or have people been able to do like even head lettuce in them or other other crops like that. Um, anybody messed around with stuff like that, I guess. Um, Kyle, I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I definitely haven't invented anything. You know, I'm not doing anything original. I, if anything, this is a shout out to what Andy and Chris are doing on the, on the blog. It's, it's been amazing. And I pretty much just like, done a basic blueprint of what they do there for <laughs> for my wash pack situation um yeah. but i did the uh the speed queen conversion there for the it's a it's a bit of an investment as a washing machine it's, it's expensive it's like when i bought it, it was like 1500 bucks and then you're basically gutting the entire thing so it's it's kind of it's frightening seeing everything on the ground but um that fits the fish you, you know the uh the fish barrels there, the orange uh, kind of uh, fish totes or fish barrels are called. It fits them perfect. And so basically you can just be kind of moving right through and putting them in, spinning them, put it on a timer, finishes up by itself. And then, you know, just goes, you can just keep adding, keep adding, keep adding as the yeah. uh, fish barrels. Uh, uh, Andy, what are they called? The fish uh, baskets. Baskets. Fish baskets. Thank yeah, you. Baskets. Um, we'll help you out. Thank you um yeah i've done everything in there i do arugula sometimes gets beat up a little bit but i just find that i put less in the basket itself and it seems to do all right and spin it for less time um but that's the only thing that really gets pretty or gets bruised but that was even an upgrade from what i was doing before and it was getting really bruised um and i haven't done it in salad spin, so i don't i don't have any way any way to compare that um but I think that that's what I do, and I, I really I really like it a lot. What was your break point, yeah, I mean, you know, per per pounds total that you, you're doing where that switchover happened? Well, I mean, I I started at the very beginning from like swinging uh, laundry bags, you know, over my head, and then moving up to the green spinner, and then moving up to the to the bass, you know, to the um, laundry bags in the uh, old washing machine. 
And one time I had to move the farm and that washing machine was in the ice. So I had to chip it out and it got all bent. So when you turn it on, it was like you needed ear protection. It was ridiculous. So that was the biggest switch for me. It was like just having a better, more efficient um, greens spinner that wasn't unbearably loud and like it looked like it was possessed by the devil. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm on the same, around the same as Kyle you know, like between 100 and 200 pounds of greens a week. Um, and it, it seems to do all right. The problem that I, the biggest problem that I found this past year was uh, the containers themselves. I use those big 110 gallon uh, tubs, like the the uh, Rubbermaid or whatever tubs. And I found that those weren't big enough to do some of the bigger washes. And so what I did is I found a 300 gallon old, it was an old maple container um on craigslist recently and i think that's going to be great because that's going to about triple my size so rather than having to do like you know two and a half totes at a time i could probably do like six or eight totes at a time um and do the whole wash and just do it more seamlessly that way and that helps because in addition to that there's a bubbler i have a bubbler system um in there that i got also got off the um the ag engineering site that i made and um that's great for mixing greens um because i i don't do mixed greens all together I, I grow them as separate varieties and i cut each variety and so end up having to mix them in the wash pack so having a bigger tank with this with the bubbler makes it a lot easier to mix all that stuff up because you can just throw in the totes all together and it mixes itself which is great i said the, the spinner thanks ryan as yep. well i mean i I think it's silly that we probably haven't switched over yet. I think some of it, like I said, is space for us. And then also the one we have is a, it's not a 120, I think it's a, I mean, it's 120, but it's, well, whatever. I don't know. The plug was weird, but it, it's a salad ace by Delfield. Mm -hmm. um, the 20 gallon electric quarter horsepower with the timer. Um, yeah. I don't know if I really have an excuse for not using it besides just like trying to make it a target. Yeah, <laughs> et cetera, time and whatever. Um, but you're yeah, pretty busy. I think, yeah, um, we all are. Uh, but I, I think that um, just figuring out like that batch size for sinks and like getting the other getting more bins so you can keep loading like you're talking about is where i definitely want to see um the new space um have some of those features just so that it is something that um it doesn't you know when you can wash it then you can spend more time packing than you are standing there washing and and whatnot and so uh, anyways that was great though thank you Yeah, Ryan, I think that is kind of an essential point that you brought up, uh, which is it's one thing to purchase a piece of equipment that works well. It's another thing to sort of scale your all the pieces in your line so that you're operating in optimal kind of integration efficiency. So it's like that. Where is the where is the weak link? Um, and if what you're what I'm hearing you say is that if you have a speed queen with those uh, baskets that fit there, um, that's great. But you also really need a bigger, at least initial tank if you're going to maximize that piece of equipment. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I think so. I think having everything be compatible is obviously the most helpful and efficient way to do it. Um, and I, you know, I'll keep the bubbler. The nice thing about the bubbler is if you have the, the spa jet thing, um, you can build different, uh, basically setups or different tanks. So like I'll keep the hundred gallon tank to do, I don't know, like head, heads of lettuce or bunches or whatever, and then have that other tank that you can just kind of swap the, the spa blower onto a different setup essentially for a different tank. Very cool. Yeah. One yeah. Questions Real quick, are, oh, that's oh, just, sorry. is that the one? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, yeah, it was a nice gift for sure. Um, 
long story, but um, <laughs> not really. Um, my one question we always find is like, we're washing our triple wash starts with basically like a 13 gallon um, volume of water. We throw in however many bulb crates full of greens, then another 13 gallon volume of water, and then a smaller and then a, and a spin. But one of the things that we like is that we can change that water really quickly because it's a low volume. Whereas if we have a 50 or whatever gallon or a hundred, I guess I'm not saying it's that I don't want to go that way. I'm just trying to understand, like, are you then washing into your bubbler or whatever that tank is like a hundred pounds at one time so that you're not having to change that water as often, not only from just like wasting water point of view, but to fill a hundred gallons takes a while versus, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody has any experience with that, but. Brian, do you want to say anything about that? Since yeah, it was I'm direct just thinking about that, like, you know, um, trying to think back to the summer. Um, I think the biggest thing is we have a we have really good water pressure, so it does, actually doesn't take that long for us to fill up 100 gallons. And um, with the bubbler, sure. I think the greens come out significantly cleaner than they would even during a triple wash. And so um, there's instances where I may not even triple wash. Um, and then basically the way the bubbler works is especially if it's set up high all that sediment settles down um and then just i change the water as needed when it's when it gets really gross um and then you know have this whole system of using dirtier water for maybe like a first wash if i am triple washing like lettuce or spinach something like that um and so i've had multiple tanks going in the wash pack all at once and then during that time then i can kind of swap it's basically like a a game of Tetris kind of like you you're draining one tank filling another one is used for washing and it's just kind of a cycle of all, of all those things in, in clean water sort of clean water and dirty water and Ryan do you feel like are those tanks all the same size let's say you had three tanks they would all be you know 100 gallon tanks they were yeah last year but this is the first year I just bought a, that maple container which is a stainless 300 gallon tank so I haven't even had an opportunity to use that yet gotcha yeah. Cool. Yeah. Patrick, you uh, your hand was up and down a little. Are you? Did you have something there you want to either ask or add or? Yeah, actually, uh, I I think I got uh, the flow. I, my question was going to be uh, how many stages of washing you go through, um, but I think I got that answered uh, from the other conversation. But the uh, other question I was going to say is is. Uh, so what I've heard so far has been primarily seems like it's geared towards uh, greens. And um, I don't know uh, whether you're going to have a separate, whether you're going to partition the conversation by uh, different kinds of washing, like root vegetables versus greens and the different equipment or how you want to handle that. Absolutely. I mean, take it, let you guys take this where it makes sense to, to take it. Um, and uh why don't we just you can either do that or let me just see check in with carrie too to see if she has a greens follow-up thing and maybe we'll switch switch over um uh, switch product after that yeah i was just gonna say i have that deerfield walk spinner i bought it on ebay and you definitely need to secure it to the you need to secure it to something they they tend to walk um but i love it i've done green beans in it which I know most people don't wash green beans, but I dunk my green beans and then I spin them and they I can hold them in the cooler for up to two weeks with no rotting, no problem, which is re really nice. I don't know if you do green beans. Um, and I also have a maple stock tank. I think it's 250 gallons stainless and it's kind of got the oval shape. So the sediment falls nicely to the bottom and I can easily do like 60 pounds without having to change it, sometimes more, so. Uh, just be, you know, this payback thing too, when I think about those larger ones, and, and again, this is my personal experience working on produce farms, but also seeing a lot, that deeper sediment, even if it takes a while to fill it, you don't have the number of breaks. It's like a big, you know, the you can definitely go for um, a bit um, of time and uh, that can be a huge benefit. Uh, and as you were saying, 
Ryan, kind of bit of Tetris, like, you know, when something's filling, you've got other things you can do. So as long as you're not sitting around waiting for it, um, it's all good. Yeah, I am a little concerned to see the time it's going to take to drain and refill, you know, 250 gallons as opposed to 80 gallons, which is what I've been doing. Um, so, Carrie, I don't know, is 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 that a pretty quick process, draining and then getting the sediment out? Or is the, is like the drain in the bottom of that container that you use? You know, it is on the bottom. I've never timed it. It's pretty large. It's, I, it, it's probably at least a half inch of three quarter inch opening. Um, it probably takes 10 minutes to drain is my guess. I've never timed it, um, but it's yeah. it's not horrible. And then to fill it is, I think like 11 minutes maybe mm -hmm. to fill it. Yeah, and if you have um, some sanitizer in a bigger tank that the sediment settles, uh, you can use it for a while. I mean, test especially that P, the PA, that's durable sanitizer, like a whole session potentially. And and you're it's like a first tank that um, can be really helpful. But, hey, Pooh. Hi, Tom. Um, sorry. How are you? Fashionably late as usual. So I'm sorry. Well, that's good. That's excellent. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it's totally fine. Uh, thank you for joining at all. And uh, we're we're uh, doing sort of ping pong, uh, lots of different questions and thoughts about new equipment um, and um, thinking about payback, but holistically, like not just financial, sort of how it changes the whole flow of your system and, you know, a little thinking on time about making upgrades and what they've done. So I do have a couple of slides at your place and I, I would um, we'll turn it over to you in a minute just to chat a little bit about your upgrade and any anything you want to say about some of the new equipment you got um, be, before. Do, is that OK in just a minute or two if if uh, if you're able to uh, talk for a bit? Uh, sure. Um, well, actually, one of the, I had one of the questions for the group that uh, always sort of interested me is to is. <clears throat> We, you know, we talked about efficiencies and upgrading, you know, to get current to, for, for, for efficiencies mostly. Of course, ours was driven by uh, FISMA primarily, I think, at the time uh, to, yeah. to, to get into compliance. And, and, and so doing, I was wondering if if that is still a consideration and the changes in FISMA might, you know, have alter alter that trajectory of how deep you get into it. You know, I mean, like. There's always that question of, of you know your cleaning your brush rolls and things like that, and is that mm -hmm. people, is this thing that people think are having to think about still, and you know we'll, yeah. going forward, how does that impact how anybody decides what their upgrades are going to be? Well, that is a great question because it's there's a lot of unknowns there, right? I mean that the brush those uh, brush wash rollers have been the case in point. Um, yeah, um, so who I'm going to come right back to you and actually ask you to also say where you're calling in from, uh, but I wanted to hear Patrick's question first because um, I, I'm not I just want to think about where that can come in in the flow of this whole thing. So Patrick, would you at least mind posing that and we may um, come back to it in a little bit? Sure. You're talking about the question on root vegetables. Wash yeah. Yep, yeah. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to. Uh, what one of the things I'm facing is I do uh, <clears throat> uh, sort of a wide variety, about 40 different crops for CSA. So I, I am interested in knowing what equipment I'm going to need and and how versatile it needs to be. And so uh, obviously, there's a lot of difference between washing greens. And, and root vegetables. So mm -hmm. am I looking at sort of two lines, two, two uh, <clears throat> different kinds of cleaning lines, or am I looking at more than that? So that would be my general question is how, how many types of cleaning do you need and how many types of, of cleaning uh, machinery and techniques do you need is, is sort of the question. Uh, sorry, in the acreage, you, it's, it sounds like it's I, a fair number. Acres. I'm, I'm small. I'm small, about five acres. Uh, yeah. But 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 um, <clears throat> my my intentions are to learn on the five acres that I've got right here on my own personal property and, and get bigger later on. So uh -huh. I'm trying to learn 
uh, what I need to know uh, for the future. Yep. Well, let's come back to that um, definitely, and you'll and uh, as you see some of this other stuff like the rinse conveyors and uh, ferro washers, and yeah, of course, a couple at least a couple lines um, are are want you know are probably needed for at least that kind of volume. Um, others can chime in and as they will. Uh, okay, well, who um, if if you're able, I've got a a couple of pictures here and if you want to just say where you're calling from real quick and okay. um, uh, share a little bit and yeah maybe we get to that FISMA thing here because we do actually have a couple couple of people who might be able to speak on that subject too so um well yeah go ahead and um yeah where you're where you're calling in from and I'm going to share just a photo or two here okay Am I to see the photos on my screen? You, you will see them momentarily. Um, let me just, there we go, that'll work, I bet. Um, to, to the group, you, you have to understand I'm technologically impaired <laughs> of this type of stuff, so. <laughs> yeah, um, well, <laughs> apparently I'm technologically impaired too, because I uh, don't see this, um, my PowerPoint um, to share here. Well, um, I, I can, go ahead and start just oh there it is okay okay um uh historically in 2014 this was this was our situation in 2013 um uh as my son as ray has come into the business uh he has done more with the wholesale vegetable uh operation uh, part of the business um and so we found ourselves in a situation with that this was bought we were we, we have a pretty good relationship with the Hanover co-op and we 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 were starting to do root vegetables and and things that we're always doing on a limited scale and we wanted to we had no storage and we really didn't have the the wash and pack facility to do root crops at any level i mean i had a i had a you know a barrel washer of sorts that sat outside um but you know it was pretty old and it looked like the new, you know, FISMA was on the horizon. So we were in the process of, of trying to switch over from this, what you see, you know, here, um, this smaller barn situation uh, to something that we could actually store with, with refrigeration. Uh, and we sort of moved, uh, we built a whole 60 by 40 building and moved um, our whole wash and pack out operation in there as well as uh, built cooler space for uh, 25 bushel bins. And uh, you see the cooler there on your left. Um, and part of this new uh, expansion uh, coincided with uh, Food Safety Modernization Act. So Ray felt that in terms of washing, not the microgreens or the smaller things or lettuces, but you know, um, crops like, uh, you know, bunch of carrots, bunch of beets, scallions, things like that. The rinse conveyor was the way to go. And, and they use that for peppers and a lot of things now. Uh, and essentially this does most of the work that that old green uh, Amish uh, system used to do. Uh, does a nicer job. It's, you know, it's faster. We had set up to do it. and. And we do have the other one still sort of set up behind this machine that you see here. And uh, I think sometimes Michael will run cucumbers through it. If there's a, if there's a bunch of people working in the area, um, he will still use the brush washer um, for that. Um, this, this one here, oops, on the right, uh, on the right here, this baby. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the previous system with a grading table at the end of it. And it works, yeah. it works pretty well. Um, getting a little long in the tooth, you know, I mean, there's some wobble in the bearings and we, we would go through them and try the brush rolls needed to be replaced. So um, it was a, they had just started making that stainless steel unit. Um, I think Jericho settlers had the first one that, that we were aware of and uh, we went up and set it and, and, uh, and we knew that everything had to be as we could, we had to put as much stainless steel in the wash area as we, we possibly could. So this was part of that. 
what you don't see. I don't, did you get a picture of the brush roll? Uh, you know, potato washer, Hans. I can't remember. Um, I, yeah, I don't. I don't have it. But um, yeah, I just had a few photos from a few years ago. Um, yeah. So okay. that's what we uh, got. If you go into that space, we on this side of the on this side of this rinse conveyor, we have um, it's called a polisher, if you will. But it's it's a high speed brush roll that we've set up with a conveyor and a a bin dumper. That we do all the you know fall carrots and you know fall fall root crops run it gets run through that instead, um, and uh, we, you know the the the, the question um, Pat uh, brought up about you know how many wash lines do I need um, I think is a really interesting one because uh, you know especially we don't do any like you know lettuce is not a wholesale thing for us we grow some for our farm stand. We'll sell, you know, we'll fill in a couple of cases here and there to friends or who, you know, get short or whatever. You know, in the middle of the summer, everybody's begging lettuce from here where we can get it when it gets really hot and nasty. Um, but we don't do lettuce and we don't do do smaller greens and things like that, a lot of greens business. And that would probably dictate you had something completely different than this. So it's conceivable, depending upon what your, your goals are, which where you want to go with your farm, you could have. I don't know, maybe three or four separate lines for all the different things that you end up doing. Um, we don't do that, so we, we we make sure we get by with the with the, the two systems we got, which are essentially the rinse conveyor and 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 uh, the the uh, polisher brush roll polisher for the mm -hmm. fall. So, yeah, and and you um, your how many acres to, of veggies in general? You're doing like. 40 or something. Well, I'm sorry, what was that? How many acres of veg are you doing? Oh, I, 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 everything with cover crops is 100 now. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we do six, six acres of potatoes, um, probably three acres of carrots, um, oh, acre and a half of, of beets, and then, you know, a couple of rows of turnips. We don't sell a lot of turnips. Uh, we did a half acre sweet potato last year, but they don't get one through anything anyway. So, um, yeah, that's pretty where that's where we were last year. Mm. So I'm looking at. Um, are you guys seeing this PowerPoint? I'm sorry. Are you, you're all seeing the PowerPoint. It just says yeah. Brian says I don't see it. I, I see it, Pat. Okay. Pat sees it. Okay. Good. Um, I just a. a technically challenged issue over here. So I'm, I'm all good. Now. Okay. okay. So um, Patrick, maybe that's getting towards um, your question there. And that was a good answer. And I uh, thank you very much for that. Yeah, it, 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 I had a hunch it, it would be mm -hmm. uh, depending on your size. Uh, yeah, you got to have more than one or two pieces of equipment. And yep. get it all set up. Yep. And even the rinse conveyor, which is highly versatile, is not necessarily great for high volumes of roots, like when you get really cranking. Um, and Andy will mention this in a minute when we're looking at this these photos. Anyway, Kyle, were you um, about to say something? Yeah, I was just going to share my two cents on your question, yep. Patrick. We, um, you know, like I said, we have about five acres of vegetable production um, with three quarters of an acre in high tunnel space. And um, we don't wholesale a lot of root crops really at all. Um, we do have them for ourselves and for, um, so we, we have a 75 member plus year round CSA. And then we do the farmer's market um, most of the year and we have a farm store as well. And so um, most of our wholesale is greens or um, we do some winter squash and tomatoes in summer and stuff like that. But I will say for us, um, you know, we've, we've, we've squeaked by for eight or not nine. This will be our ninth season. With a pretty minimal setup of, you know, three sinks, a spinner, um, a garden hose, sprayer. We do have a barrel washer, which I know some people had some questions about. I would definitely jump in on that conversation at a later time. Um, but, um, for the most part, we're able to um, wash, pack, and and 
and sell, you know, what we do with a, basically like two lines, I guess, if you look mm -hmm. at it like that. Um, our barrel washer, though, is really only used in the fall um, and set up outside. And then we ideally I would have it set up all the time on wheels inside, but that's not happening yet. Um, so just to give you that feel. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that. That's good. I'm learning a lot here. Now, Pooh, one, uh, one quick question to just like I'm putting two and two together here. You're talking about FISMA, stainless steel, the new facility, um, and we're kind of scratching our heads on on payback. And to me, there's maybe like I'm wondering how you in your mind just resolve that. Like, OK, is it was it, so if you ask the question, OK, well, what what was the pay? What's the payback like? How does it feel now compared to the way it was then? You, what I'm hearing, and the question is that, well, that's a complicated question because um, really you felt like, uh, OK, we had to do this because of FISMA. Like this is this is where we're going and we've got to do it. Um, is that correct? And I mean, that's basically what I'm asking. It's like it's hard to evaluate the whole thing. Yeah, no, I mean, as many of you remember, I was one of the one of the guys who was most paranoid about this whole thing and, and yeah. taking everything that was said the most literally so we were you know we were making an upgrade and we that it was the driving force to move to stainless steel and upgrade all this stuff we knew we were, you know we were we were expanding at the same time but you know i mean as i admitted to hans the other day got no damn ideas for the enterprise value of what that is or you know i think you know there's a there's a there's a gut feeling that you know uh, once you get past the expense and you, you're you're working that machine or any machine in your in your business or farm you know you can you you know you know you, you go all this and said boy I, you know, I really didn't need to spend 20,000 on that when I could have got the Amish transplanter and that would have been probably more appropriate. Or you can get to this point where you say, well, we're really, you know, we really run those a bunch of potatoes and it does a good job and it does such a nice job on the root crop. We really can, we can run things faster. This is, this is great, you know, and I think that's, 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 that it's not a question of you can necessarily line it out. You should be able to if you're a decent businessman. I am not, but I think we would say that all these things were we've gained efficiency with, and I think that's the most exciting thing. It's nice to be able to pass, you know, have a have have equipment that that doesn't draw attention to itself in a FISMA inspection for you know at our size, but it's also it's also great to have this equipment. All of a sudden, you can do stuff. And a hell of a, you know, so much faster and, you know, so much, so much easier. Mm. That answer the question for anybody, or just avoid the question altogether. <laughs> that well, that was a really important answer, and it split. It was um, bifurcated, which is like anything; it's complicated. And even I'm wondering about your, you know, you've been farming for four decades or whatever, and your kids are, you know, taking over. Like how? is it impacted that transition like you know that having that equipment is it can you look at that like what's in terms of the more either the quality of life or how the business is moving um how has this new facility you know changed changed that oh you know i think ray would tell you that um, Ray's his son, by the way. Yeah, Ray or, Ray or Mike would, would sit around and say, why didn't we build it sooner? Why didn't we build it bigger? Um, you know, you never have enough storage. Uh, we built it looked like it looked like a monstrosity of a barn when the when they're pouring the cement. And then when you get the bent, the, the bill for the cement, you're really sure it's a monstrosity of the barn. But it fills up. It really fills up quickly. And you, you, you know, you all of a sudden you forget that there are space, space utilizations that, that you hadn't thought that are beneficial. We also have in our packing line a, a, a blueberry packer, clamshell packer. I think I don't think they use it for cherry tomatoes, but we use it on the blueberries. And you know, it one guy goes in in an hour and does what 
three guys would do in an hour or an hour and a half in terms of packing out the blueberries for the co-op. And so these things, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> all things factored in, it's nice to know that your packing equipment feels like it's making you good money and saving you labor and makes you happy because, you know, a good drought will not. And those are, those are things that go in total pro into total profitability. Mm. Cool. So that's interesting that the younger generation may have a slightly different take on, on the whole thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, um, you know, as I say, and, and you were generous. It's five decades. What? <laughs> well, I, I thought you were, I was doing the math. I thought you were 60, but maybe you're a little yeah. older than that. Yeah, I wish I was. I was skiing a whole lot better then. <laughs> uh, uh, great. Uh, well, we don't have too much more time. This is, I mean, these are just like bringing up some really interesting points. I did want to, um, Andy, I'm just wondering if you could be Phoenix for a, just a minute um, or pretend and say, you know, again, imagine them and their the payback thing and sort of how they got into this and, and a little, any lessons learned at this point from that you have, can share secondhand. And I'll share my screen again. I got a video too. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I can't cover Phoenix's main accent, but uh, I can talk to his line a little bit. Um, they recently built this building. It's uh, forty by sixty, I think. Um, steel building, clear span, concrete floor, big trench drain in the middle. Um, this was built on two years ago budget, which was like a $220,000 project. And um, I know the price to essentially do this in today's dollars has almost doubled uh, just from the price of steel. So that's uh, uh, a little more challenging now just with the materials cost and whatnot. Uh, like I said, I have a full blog post written up on this, so you should check that out. Uh, Go.uvm.edu slash Hallbrook. Uh, we'll get you there. Um, but I can talk about the rinse conveyor a little bit. He is doing, I'm not sure, 20, 30 acres of crops. Uh, and you can see he's got uh, the a full AZS line. Uh, a lot of people may start with the rinse conveyor because it's uh, around the 10 grand mark. And it's a very versatile machine. And it's for the most part, quite a bit easier to clean than the than the traditional brush washers that we had talked about. Uh, that being said, you very quickly start to realize that you're going to want a conveyor, an infeed conveyor, and then uh, this round sorting table at the end. Um, so that drives up some more cost. And then he also has a uh, air knife conveyor, uh, which blows off some of the water before the sort table. So that's something else. And then if you really get into high volume roots, which I know Mark and Krista Jericho settlers do this as well as they have a, a big barrel washer. This is a written, uh, barrel washer from AZS polycarbonate and stainless steel. So it's slightly easier to clean than uh, uh, the wooden grindstone models. Uh, and they put that ahead of the rinse conveyor. So the bulk of the, the mud and the soil and the rootlets get all washed off in the, in the root washer in the, the barrel washer and then the rinse conveyor is really just doing a final rinse um, as if you put a whole bunch of mud through the rinse conveyor it's just going to plug up full of mud because it's just, it it recirculates the water um, so that whole lower compartment is kind of like a bathtub so it's good if you're doing you know bunched beets and stuff like that uh, but heavily soiled crops it would require a little more clean out um, I got a sure short video it, of it in action. If you want to see that, it's like 12 seconds or something. Sure. Yep. Let's see, I think I can make this work. So there's that air knife in the middle and the roller packing. So has he, what did, what is, what have they said about payback stuff or volume increases or how this has changed? Is it like night and day, new new world or? 
Yeah, it was the kind of thing where he's selling to Hannaford's uh, <laughs> in Maine, and they could pretty much take as much as he could grow. So uh-huh. they like doubled and tripled production and ramped up over a couple year period very rapidly. And so there was just no physical way they could do this with hoses and sinks. Um, and the, before they were working out of a greenhouse, they had a greenhouse with a concrete slab um, with the, those Rubbermaid stock tanks and stuff, just like we've talked about. And they they grew out of that. And that's kind of a different situation where it's just like this market opens up and there's not really much of a choice, you know, if you're going to meet it, you got to do something. And and I will say they just barely finished this this fall. And when I talked to him in December, they said they already wished that they was bigger. (laughs) They've got one cooler in the corner and they've since backed a 53 foot reefer trailer up to their loading dock essentially as a permanent cooler space until they can build a new cooler next door because they have no space to store um, Mm. all these bins of crops. So I've heard it too many times, you know, build as big as you can because you're always going to wish you could do more. But I know, like everybody else, they they did build as big as they they could afford at the time. And Mm -hmm. it's still a lot better than what they could. One thing he did do in here was like he... um, like he heated this space and just having a spot where you can seek reprieve reprieve from the wind has been huge for employees. And I know people have said that before too, that um, the pencil, when you're penciling out like your ROI, you can also think about your employee retention and then the cost it takes to train new employees and recruit new employees versus if you have a space that is more comfortable and more convenient and more um, ergonomic, you can definitely save on employee expense as well. Uh, I see one comment. How do they handle the soil and mud buildup? Um, They have a trench drain here in the center that's 12 inches wide and 30 feet long, and that acts as a sediment basin. Uh, Therefore, it's probably almost two feet deep. I don't know what their standpipe is, but basically at the end of the day, they can remove those metal grates, shovel out the the major mud, um, and reset for the next time. Great. And you'll see there, I like this photo because it not only has this whole line here, but the two hundred and hundred gallon stock tanks. And there's that green spinner, Kyle. And Pooh's sitting sitting right like there. The same one, so <laughs> I guess that's the popular one today. <laughs> it is, and and Pooh had it too, or has it? Um, and here's that, you know, just the setup with the greens too. It it looks a little bit like Helter Skelter. There's brick, you know, the cinder blocks were put out, and that that thing. I don't know if it's walking around or the uh, screwed down to the concrete. Um, but then here's the table. It's like a bin, a, you know, a buckthorn bin upside down. Uh, or greens going in. So anyway, that's a that's an interesting uh, uh, view right there too. <laughs> uh, I see Kyle's comment thinking about replacing wood on a barrel washer with poly decking. Uh, some people have done that. I have also heard that poly decking or or PVC boards can be slippery and therefore doesn't give you that agitation and the, or the tumbling action that's needed. So therefore you have to add some more um, baffle channels like a closed dryer to inhibit more tumbling. Yeah, I was wondering um, about that. The one thing we've done is put a variable speed on our motor mm-hmm. um, so we can adjust that and then also installed um, three or four nozzles that are for a pressure washer that hook up to a a foot pedal driven pressure washer um so that we can get that kind of um volume on a smaller scale for us you know i mean i'm never ever gonna buy a line like that there's (laughs) this speaking of return on investment that's just never gonna be something i would do um space wise financially we just on five acres, it's not enough root crops I could ever sell to make that financially worth it. Um, mm. But definitely sell the greens. Um, 
so yeah but I, I do feel like if we have a barrel washer it's kind of just on saw horses that we prop up so i'm going to end up having somebody weld up a frame for it so that's on wheels and casters so that when it's in the barn we can actually maneuver it around and maybe use it a little bit more um i think ryan had said he just got a barrel washer as well um and we can you know brainstorm about that another time but yeah i definitely i mean the wood's fine you know it works um but um it sure doesn't feel very like cleanable right what's also hard to clean is i want to say the back side all those seams and nooks and crannies there's just like so many nooks and crannies let alone the wood being semi-porous itself yeah i was curious also about maybe um it's probably not cost effective but <clears throat> they must make like i mean you see that barrel washer that's in the picture you showed it's like a either a poly mesh barrel or it's i've seen them stainless steel i guess as well um probably not cheap but you know. No, yeah, that one, the the AZS unit there that I what we were just looking at is a fully polycarbonate ring, like completely enclosed with holes drilled in it for drainage, and then it actually has PVC boards through bolted at angles uh, to give it that agitation, um, and that that sandwich joint also is difficult to clean, so that's not exactly a full win either. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've strived to figure out every year, which has gotten better, but is to make sure that two people can run that barrel washer or even one person by themselves, um, if need be. Um, and using those um, pressure washer nozzles inside the barrel itself on, I, I strap them to a pipe basically, but it could be done better, um, does alleviate a lot of the need for like, two people with hoses spraying everything or this and that and different stuff yeah. which i've done but. yeah no that makes sense to to mount <laughs> mount the nozzles no no need to hold a hose have any of you you, you know that will see the will see drum washer small small scale stainless is probably the like for a very small a smaller volume is a good way to Go, but also expensive. Um, so, any experience with other smaller, uh, less expensive, you know, lower cost of entry barrel washers or even self made um, barrel washers? There is a Univerco washer that is very similar to the Wilsey as well. Mm -hmm. I don't remember its cost, probably quite a bit, but. Mm. Yeah. Same thing. It's a stainless drum. Yeah. Cool. Um, a, a couple, I guess they were kind of hacks with uh, cement, what, like an electric cement mixer. Um, they're, you know, significantly smaller volume, but um, somebody had, you know, punched holes in it and then rigged up kind of a, a hose sprayer that sprayed in it. And, you know, they're dumpable, so you can, you know, pivot them down into in it, um, into like a tote or something like that. Um, but I think if you just go on YouTube, you can probably find something, some some makeshift one that somebody's done. Yeah. And there's a good, Andy just posted um, a barrel root washing uh, post as well that has a lot of great stuff in it. Including spray tables. Yeah, glancing at this post, I'm reminded as well as another video uh, that we have linked that's just like a pressure washer nozzle on a regular hose mounted to the wall, just with a foot pedal. So you can rinse essentially with both hands, and something like that can really get you a long ways. Yeah. That's great. I was wondering. If anyone had any recommendations for like a sediment collection pans to put under the root washer, the barrel just I ha, I ha, just got a grindstone one that I'm going to refurbish, but um, I'd love to have something that would sort of direct the mud and sediment. Like a low lower cost, but but effective yeah. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've seen a couple <laughs> places used effectively metal roofing actually that um, is put at an angle under oh, the yeah. thing with the collection, some kind of collection. Um, Got it. 
in, in Georgia, there's a guy there, and I've seen another one too um, that actually worked pretty well. I don't know, Andy, have you seen other things or other people? Anything I think I have, but I can't think of the picture, so it's not coming to mind. But um, <laughs> Chris and I thought of uh, what we need is a, a morgue table. <laughs> the morgue a, table. <laughs> <laughs> it's shallow and you know three feet wide, eight feet long, um, but it has you know a a lip on it and a drain attached to it. That's essentially what you need is a really big shallow sink. And um, mm -hmm. there's probably a restaurant style table or out table. there that uh, I just don't have a link for right now. I like the more Thank tables. you. <laughs> okay, well, I'm looking at time and I wanna um, wrap this up. If there are any other burning uh, things, pipe up now, forever hold your peace and um, this really is, you know, uh, again, very informal, but questions come up, we'll put them out there. We're trying to just get people together, hold some space to bat some stuff around, which I think we've done here. Um, payback being not just financial, there's a whole slew of things that go with it. Um, and just taking some time to step back and evaluate some of that stuff, ask other people, uh, et cetera. So really thank you all. Um, for coming coming out and just contributing in whatever way um, you you uh, brought today, and there is a form there which I now um, if, before you leave it, just take a minute to fill out. I'll post it again here in case it's down on your or up on your um, scroll. But if you look in the chat, just there's a a little form right there that just uh, if you could fill in, that'd be great because we're collecting this stuff. This is we got a report on this uh, grant and how many people are involved and in what they're doing. So your feedback for a sec would be great. Hey Hans, Thanks very much. I just I just opened that link up and it's on my computer. It's not clickable, so I'm just curious if other people like I can't I can't answer the questions. Nothing happens. Um, anyone else? I'm able to do it. Work. Or for me. Don't take it personally. Is anyone <laughs> yeah. anyone else? That's okay. <laughs> as long as it's only me, then they we're good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ryan. The next in two weeks, we're not going next week for Valentine's Day. That would be that would be a crime. Plus Nova's coming up. Uh, but the week after Valentine's Day, the 21st, we're, uh, we have our next round table, and that is um, on greens. Let me just see here, get to it, because it's, yeah, workarounds in washing greens you can't live without. And then February 28th is parent, farmer, Wash pack manager strategies to keep kids happy, employees engaged and productive, food safety risk low. Then March 7th is what not to do and uh, <laughs> to save time in the pack shed, so dry cleaning and, and things that you might not want to clean. And then finally on the 14th, uh, how to uh, talk with contractors or work with contractors about your farm building construction projects. That's it. All right, folks. So when you're done with that, we can sign off, I believe. And Pooh, thanks for for coming on. Sorry, sorry, I was late. Yeah, I no, forgot. not it. <laughs> That's good. The prerogative of this age, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And. Kyle and Carrie and Ryan and Elizabeth, Chandler, Harry, Heather, have a good evening. Thanks for, for um, submitting that form. Thank you. Yep. Be in touch, everyone.